without further ado, I hand over to Jacques for context setting. Thank you, uh, Patrick, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, many thanks to uh, Thierry de Montréal for organizing this, uh, this beautiful conference. I'm learning a lot on, uh, with my numerous hats, and uh, so thank, thanks much for that, and congratulations. Um, actually, I spent 30 years of my life trying to working on, on market access issues in, in the healthcare system and trying to carve out the value of therapeutic innovations, uh, both for society and in economic terms, to, to, to make them solvent. And my talk today will address the difficulty of reconciling supply and demand in, in this uh, ever burgeoning field of uh, healthcare services and products, and to suggest potential ways to introduce some strategic drive to maximize the benefit for society, um, of, because actually the field is not driven by any invisible hand, and, and this is why um, governments find it very difficult to uh, regulate healthcare. So we'll give a quick look to the, what is demand and what is supply in this, in this field. Uh, on the demand side, uh, demand side is enumerable in, in real terms. The international classification of diseases which is established by W, uh, lists a total of 55,000 different codes for as many disease definitions, of which about 7,000 to 8,000 orphan diseases, and, and each and every patient expects that a cure will be brought for his uh, or her disease. Uh, in economic terms, this concrete demand is made solvent in uh, most cases by payers or insurers, where the public or private, whether monopolistic or, or uh, uh, com commercial and competing, who account for a major chunk of the expense. So the, actually the, uh, the patient often doesn't pay much. And, and overall the public contribution to uh, health exp expenditures reaches 60%. It varies from 24% in, in low income countries to 71% in OECD countries, but it's growing 1% faster than GDP almost everywhere. And, and those expenses are almost systematically considered as, as a constraint, as something which governments don't like, uh, regardless of their positive impact on the economy, both because they contribute to reducing the burden of disease, which otherwise would have a cost in terms of illness, and also because there is the value added of, of providers and suppliers, which has to be taken into account in terms of, of jobs, uh, progress in technology and, and manufacturing, which leads us to look more in detail to the supply side. And we've seen that the demand side is extremely scattered. The demand side is just as scattered, as much scattered. Uh, you have a, a, a few leading players in the provision of care, like the uh, national health system in the UK. But in most cases, providers are, are still very small, very fragmented organizations. In the US, the top 10 US providers of care uh, were responsible for only 18% of, of all uh, inpatient days in the country. And, uh, so, and, and this provider universe uh, which is highly job intensive still, and, and we may talk later on, on what can be done to improve the productivity, is, uh, has very low profitability, mostly in the uh, low uh, one-figure percentage, although some outliers uh, can, I would say, provide much higher returns. And, uh, and productivity is decreasing globally. I mean, this has been pointed out by, by a number of studies. Uh, in the pharma industry, uh, fragmentation is very high as well. The, the, the leader owns about 5% of the total prescription market. Uh, in the medical technology industry, the top 10 companies earn about 40% of, uh, of global market share. So this comes in strong contrast to other technology-driven industries, such as uh, aerospace or uh, 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 information communication technology or the GAFAMs. And this is something on which we could think I would say, I mean, I, I have some ideas on the reasons, but we don't have time to elaborate about that. Um, contrary to care provision, the uh, pharma and medtech industry do enjoy lofty returns on capital, but again, the profitability is decreasing, 
for some number of reasons, one of which being the fact that they enjoyed those lofty returns because they carried a high level of risk and, and the evolution of the field today leads to put the risk on the shoulders of uh, mostly VC funded uh, uh, companies, uh, startup companies. Today, more than 50% of innovations are brought forward by recent companies, young companies, which have uh, been very innovative. So again, a big change in the structure of the industry. Now, what does the supply side uh, provide the demand side with? Mostly innovation. Keep in mind, uh, today, at this time, there are about 350,000 clinical trials ongoing in the world, of which two Almost 300,000 are interventional, i.e. aim to show the, to measure the, the effect of a given intervention. So in summary, thousands, or I would say, yeah, thousands of diseases, uh, hundreds of millions of patients, uh, thousands of care providers, and hundreds of suppliers offering myriads of solutions. And who is regulating this in economic terms? And, and my answer is at this stage, there is very little strategic insight, and this is why expenses are looming and, and people still are unhappy with that. Now, you can only regulate what you measure, and this brings us to ask which metrics are available, so I'm not going into a, a course in health economics, but keep in mind that epidemiologists, uh, health economists, um, clinicians have tried to find a way to compare diseases between, you, you know, between each other. So they've uh, defined what are called disability-adjusted uh, uh, life years, quality-adjusted life years, but, but this doesn't provide you with the view of whether you should rather treat disease A rather than disease B. And it's the same for uh, clinical trials. So I'm not going to uh, go into this, but let's keep in mind that there is really a, a plenty of thought to be uh, given to how to measure the impact the effect of, of care on, on society. And, and this brings us very often to ethical issues that will be discussed by, by Danielle. So when it comes to curbing healthcare expenses, payers are left without much clue as to how to do this in a strategic way. And most of them oscillate between a variety of cost control schemes. Again, I don't go into the details, but most of them are just cost control schemes and, and they don't have, they don't consider expenses as an investment, and they don't say which preference society would have. So this is the reason why more and more voices in the academic community call for a more rational, data-based, socially acceptable strategy uh, to be concerted amongst healthcare stakeholders, including patients, because as mentioned, the patient is central. Uh, he often doesn't have much say as to how he's treated, but he's asking for more say in, in, in this field. Um, as a patient, he feels that remedies should bring to his ill whatever he's suffering from. But as a taxpayer, as an insured person, he doesn't want to pay for everybody else. And so he's really kind of in a, in a, in a schizophrenic situation. And, and at the macro level, no institution, I mean, there was a talk uh, earlier on about uh, the role of WHO, but, but there is no real institution vested with the role to define and the power to enforce a strategic distribution of resources to the innumerable health interventions that patients request individually. So my plea, and, and I will finish with that, uh, Patrick, is that the time has come to reinforce research and education in epidemiology, in uh, health economics, that the fast improvement of data collection and, and the management of data uh, using high performance communication and augmented intelligence uh, gear should allow for a more informed uh, consensus seeking definition of uh, public preferences in terms of health policy. And, and this could serve as a, a basis for the allocation of public resources to all healthcare players. And, and, and I would like to pay a specific tribute to my African friends in the room because there are a few exceptions. I mean, there are exceptions to everything that I said, 
but there are a few exceptions to what I said about the lack of management. I'm, I'm a great admirer of, the, uh, of what Rwanda has done after the war to rebuild uh, an efficient and intelligent uh, healthcare system. I heard yesterday that Senegal is going into that direction. Uh, and, and I think Africa, again, in, in this field, like in others, may pave the way, and, and I would welcome this uh, effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we'll not summarize, but just uh, for the Q&A session later on, so you raise a uh, question mark on matching supply and demand, visibility of profit over time, uh, regulating the unknown, and uh, patient versus client, uh, some of the uh, uh, points that you, you raise in your presentation. Thank you very much.